Welcome back to another weekly space news summary with me, where once again on the menu we'll be covering all the latest Starship updates from the past seven days, take a look at all the other launch events and news stories, and then provide you with a calendar of what to expect over the next seven days. So let's get right into it, starting as always with Starship updates. <laughs> The last week at Boca Chica hasn't been quite as eventful as recent weeks have been, but I've still got a few key things to talk about. I think the most notable event was a vent test of the orbital launch mount. Yes, we're used to seeing vent testing of boosters and starships, so it was certainly interesting to see a venting test coming from a static building. Speculation quickly ensued on the internet about what exactly this is and what the test was trying to establish. In short, it's likely coming from the launch ring quick disconnect arms. In long, the system being tested here is related to the ignition sequence of the outer 20 Raptor engines of the Super Heavy booster. In order to start a Raptor engine, gas is required to spin up the turbo pumps and get fuel flowing to the combustion chamber. That's why Boost 4 has the COPV tanks just above the engines. These contain the gas used to spin up the central engines on reignition, which of course is necessary to perform both the boost back burn and then the landing burn itself. Itself. However, since it's only the central engines of the booster that actually need to be ignited more than once, there's no real need to carry additional gas to start up the 20 engine outer ring, since the only time these need to be started is when the booster is still on the pad. So, instead of storing the spin up gas for the outer engines on board the rocket itself, which would of course lead to an increase in total mass of the rocket and therefore reduction in payload capacity, instead the spin up gas will be stored terrestrially and fed to each of the engines through the orbital launch mount's quick disk connect arms which will attach to each of the 20 outer engines and that is what we think this venting test is a test of a test of the pumps that will feed the gas to the turbo pumps of the outer 20 engines for the ignition sequence so there that's pretty neat <laughs> of course massive thanks to spacex 3d creation eccentric for the detailed model of the launch table which of course gives us a great perspective on what this mechanism looks like from the inside and what i've been using to kind of illustrate my points as I've been speaking, so go check that video out, there's a card on screen. In other news, we have started seeing evidence of the next Super Heavy. Nick and Suini caught these shots of a new booster common dome section being flipped, and they also snapped this photo of a common dome for Ship 24. Yes, it's amazing to see the rate at which SpaceX is building these vehicles. The way in which production is really starting to ramp up is hopefully an indicator that they're starting to really nail down the production process and help ensure that we really do get the dozen or so launches that Elon said he hoped SpaceX would achieve for 2022 in his recent talk at the SSB and BPA joint forum meeting a couple of weeks ago. On the subject of Elon shares information with us, he tweeted that it would be unlikely for early ships to splash down intact. Getting to orbit at all on first try would be a major win. This tweet was in response to Eric's latest excellent 3D artwork, man his work gets better and better with every post I swear, meaning that we probably won't be treated to epic sights like the one on screen. What's interesting though about Elon's wording here is that it mentions early ships, as in a plural, implying that we may see Booster 5 and Ship 21, as well as potentially other future rockets, also make soft water landings instead of going for a tower catch, which does go against Elon's hope that the first catch attempt would be with Booster 5, but then again, we all did think that this was a somewhat optimistic hope. Unless, of course, the Soup Heavy will be making catch arm landings first, while the upper Starship stage will continue soft landing in the ocean or landing on legs like Ship 15 did. To be honest, I think I'm getting a bit too far into the wild speculation territory, so I'll move on. In addition to catching pictures of the new common dome and Ship 24 components, Nick also got this great shot of a new pipe section being installed on the quick disconnect arm of the launch tower. Again, representing another positive step forward to space SpaceX completing stage zero. Elsewhere on Starbase, a wall of shipping containers was placed along the road leading up to ship 15 and 16, meaning that ship 15 is now no longer really visible from the public roadway, which is a shame. I did love seeing pictures of the two vehicles side by side, but I'm sure SpaceX have a good reason to build the wall. I expect they'll eventually paint it black like the other Starbase perimeter wall. Progress on the wide bay continues as you can see the structure is really starting to take shape. This will eventually allow SpaceX to build Starship vehicles at an even crazier pace than they already are, reinforcing my belief that 2022 will be the year of Starship. I'm hoping we'll see loads of launches, tests, rollouts, fireballs and Tim Dodd losing his mind from balconies. And of course make sure you've subscribed so that you can accompany me on this journey as we cover all the news and updates every single Monday and hey while you're down there smashing that button make sure to 
like the video as well if you're enjoying the ride so far. It really helps me out and I always do appreciate it. Anyway, beyond Starship, there were quite a lot of other interesting stories from the world of spaceflight last week, so let's take a look at those now. Last week saw a total of six orbital rocket launches, quite a number. The 22nd of November was host to a Chinese Long March 4C that carried a single GFN-3 satellite to low Earth orbit. The satellite will be used for Earth observation and will be operated by the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources. Two days later, we had a very big mission. On the 24th, we had NASA's double asteroid redirection test, better known as the DART mission. As the name would suggest, this mission is to test a method of planetary defense against near-Earth objects so that we don't end up going the way of the dinosaurs in the event of a giant asteroid appearing on a collision course with Earth. The DART mission will deliberately crash the space probe into the double asteroid Didymos to see if the kinetic effect of a spacecraft collision can successfully divert an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth. The collision will take place in about a year from now, the 2nd of October 2022, and it won't simply be a first-person view like with the old Ranger missions from the 60s where NASA crashed spacecraft into the moon, this time around we'll get some cool third-person views of the impact as the DART mission features a small CubeSat built by the Italian Space Agency which will separate from the main spacecraft 10 days before impact to acquire images of the collision itself and of the generated ejector. Best of luck to the DART mission as it makes its way to the asteroid. DART wasn't the only launch on the 24th of November, there were two others in fact. The first was a Soyuz 2.1B, which launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying the brand new Prechal docking module to the International Space Station. Prechal is a pressurized nodal module with a total of six docking ports. It successfully docked to the Earth-facing port of the Nyorka module, and while it's attached well, the new module won't be fully operational until cosmonauts Anton Shklaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov perform a spacewalk to install cables between Nyorka and Prechal. This spacewalk is scheduled for the 19th of January 2022. The third and final launch for the 24th came from China. This was a Kwaizu 1A rocket that launched a single Cheyenne 11 technology demonstration satellite into low Earth orbit. The next day, on the 25th of November, we saw another Soyuz 2.1B launch. This took off from the Plesetska launch site and on board was a single satellite for the Russian Ministry of Defense. It was placed into a high tundra orbit and appears to now be all operational. The last launch we saw was on the 26th of November. And this was another one from China. This was a Long March 3BE carrying a single Chinasat 1D satellite satellite to geosynchronous orbit. This will be used for military communications. Now, those were all the launches we saw last week, but it's looking like next week's launch schedule may end up being just as jam-packed as last week's, so let's take a look at that now. The first launch we expect to see will be on the 30th of November and will be from China. The rocket will be a Ceres-1, which will carry two satellites to low Earth orbit. One will be used for technology demonstration, while the other will be used for Earth observation. On the 1st of December, SpaceX will launch their next batch of Starlink satellites. As usual, this will be a Falcon 9 with 53 satellites on board. This will be the second launch to the fourth Starlink shell, but it certainly won't be the last, as SpaceX estimate that a total of 30 launches will be required to complete Starlink's fourth shell. Here's hoping the launch goes well. Next up, we'll have two launches on the 2nd of December. The first will be an Ariane space-operated Soyuz STB, launching from the French Guiana Space Center in South America. On board will be two Galileo navigational satellites, which will be placed into a medium Earth orbit. Galileo is the European Union's fully civilian global navigation satellite system and was designed to act as a substitute in the event that either the USA's GPS or Russia's GLONASS navigation systems become unavailable to the general public for any reason. After this week's launch, Europe plans to launch a total of 10 more of these satellites. The other launch on the 2nd of December will take place high above the clouds as this will be a Launcher 1 flight, which of course is launched from the wing of a modified Boeing 747. I love watching these things. On board will be three satellites, two for technology demonstration and one for Earth observation. The final launch of the week will be on Sunday the 5th of December and will be an Atlas V carrying some satellites to geosynchronous Earth orbit. One of the mission's payloads will be the Space Test Program 3 mission. This includes the Space Test Program Sat-6 satellite with the National Nuclear Security Administration Space and Atmospheric Burst Reporting System 3, NASA's Laser Communications Relay Demonstration Payload, and six secondary payloads for the US Air Force. Hopefully this mission, and of course all the other upcoming flights I mentioned, ends in success. And hopefully I can finish this video with success. Great transition. I'm basically there. There's nothing else I want to talk about this week, so I guess that means it's time to give a big thanks to all my Patreon supporters whose names are now scrolling 
scrolling on screen. And of course, I gotta thank my YouTube channel members as well. If you sign up, then you get these videos a day early when possible. And of course, it helps support what I do here. On screen should now also be a couple of video suggestions from my channel. Hopefully, they're good picks for you. But, but that's it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. I love being able to make these videos for you. And I'll see you all in the next one. Whether or not that's a Kerbal Space Program or Space News video, I don't know. Goodbye.